that, so they'll be in great hands if, uh, if you want to head over there after you eat. I'm Amy Wineland. I am the director of Summit County Public Health. We have uh, several speakers with me here tonight to talk about fentanyl. Um, it's become one of the most dangerous drug threats in our country, and it's critically important that parents understand and youth in our community understand that this threat is real, and there's a lot you need to know about it and how to talk to your kids about it. So we're here to provide this information to you and hope that we can have a conversation. We have a lot of tables in the back that have information around not just fentanyl, but other, other information, services available from our youth and family uh, department, and Building Hope is here. Our sheriff's department is here to talk about drug take back, because we know that um, medication, unused medication is easily diverted, and uh, youth often times will start uh, using prescriptions that are not prescribed to them um, because there's leftover medications in the house. So you can talk to them about the importance of dropping off your unused medication uh, when you're done using it. Um, so with me here tonight, uh, we'll be hearing, I'll, I'll be talking a little bit at the beginning just to set the stage for this epidemic that is becoming uh, and is a public health crisis. Then we'll be watching a short video about fentanyl. Um, we will be presenting to all the middle school students tomorrow. Uh, all the classes will get this information and the, and the staff as well. We were at the high school a few, a couple months ago and did the same there, um, just to make sure everybody has this information. So I'll, we'll be talking about that. Um, we're going to hear from Carol Bukovic is here, a parent, a uh, beloved parent from Eagle County who's, who has come to present with us today to talk about Jake's story. And it's critically important for us to understand that this, this is reality for a lot of families. And every data point that we talk about actually represents a family that has gone through great loss. Um, and so it's important that we keep that and hold that in our hearts when we talk about the data. Um, we'll be having, uh, then we'll hear from um, our sheriff, Sheriff Jamie Fitzsimons is here to talk to us about what we're seeing here in our community. We will have Annie McClure, one of our public health nurses, is going to talk to you about naloxone, which is an antidote to fentanyl and other opioids um, and can reverse an overdose and save lives. You will all be trained on how to do that tonight, and we have naloxone to hand you out, hand to you uh, after the presentation so that you can have it at home. This is something that should be in every first aid kit. Uh, every first aid kit in every place within the community that we can make sure that it's, uh, we're saturating our community with this life-saving tool, we want to do that. Then we'll hear from um, Elizabeth Edgar from our Youth and Family Services department about some upcoming parenting trainings and resources for parents and youth um, that we provide. And then we'll hear from Ellen, who's here um, from Building Hope, about some additional resources that we want to make sure everybody's aware of in our community. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I just went through about what we're going to talk about today. So let's talk about the, the opioid crisis. So just uh, to lay the framework, uh, what is an opioid? Opioids are a class of drugs that include the illegal, illegal drug heroin, synthetic opioids that we're going to talk about today, such as fentanyl, and pain relievers available legally by prescription. Um, oftentimes, these drugs are used during surgical procedures or after surgery, but they're intended only to be used for a short amount of time and only if prescribed to you by a provider, and only dispensed through uh, a legal pharmacy. This also includes oxycodone, hydrocodone, uh, which is oxycontin and Vicodin, codeine, morphine, and many others. Fentanyl, specifically, is a potent synthetic man-made opioid drug to mimic 
those other natural occurring opioids. It was approved by the FDA for analgesia, which is pain relief. It's been around since the 60s. And it's used for sedation during surgery, as I mentioned. It can also be used for um, people who are uh, experiencing pain with other chronic illness like cancer. Sometimes it's prescribed. When it's prescribed for cancer patients, it's actually as a patch. And it's released over time very slowly to control pain. Fentanyl is 100 times more potent than morphine and 50 times more potent than heroin. And it is known to cause respiratory depression if misused. And that's what we want to talk about today because respiratory depression can happen very quickly if somebody is ingesting it unknowingly, which is why we want to make sure everyone understands and recognizes when that might happen to somebody. It has rapid onset, as I mentioned, and the lethal dose is only two milligrams. You can see pictures here on the screen of what two milligrams means. It's 10 to 15 grains of salt, if you, if you can think about salt. Um, so it doesn't take very much to be fatal, which is why this is an incredibly dangerous drug that we are worried about because um, it's never been more potent. And the other thing is that because it's easy to produce this drug um, in garages and in basements and in makeshift labs by drug cartels, um, it's very cheap to produce. And because it only takes a small amount to have any sort of uh, effect, it's very cheap. So those two things, these drugs have never been more potent or deadly, and they've never been so cheap. <clears throat> so it's important to talk about how we got into the place of a fentanyl crisis. Um, so the rise in opioid overdose deaths can be outlined in three distinct waves. The first wave that we saw um, was really started in the early 2000s, and that was when we were seeing a lot of prescriptions of opioids being, um, being prescribed in the medical setting. Uh, big Pharma, we're hearing a lot about Big Pharma and how they're being held accountable now for misleading providers because they said this was not an addictive substance. Not unlike we've seen uh, with the tobacco industry and nicotine. Um, and so this was widely prescribed um, because guess what? If you were shown a pain scale and the happy person was no pain and the grumpy face was a lot of pain, they developed this pain scale so that people actually chose where their pain was and then people started to expect that we should never have any pain. And providers were, were prescribing this freely, they didn't talk about uh, the addictive nature of this. So we created this, uh, a large population of people who were then addicted to the opioids. Then we realized um, that this needed to be controlled and so providers stopped prescribing as much of this drug, but that left a whole population who was already addicted to this drug, and that sent them to the street to find a replacement, which was heroin. Um, and now that fentanyl has been um, developed and it's easy to produce, heroin, you know, relies on a growing season and a lot of overhead because you need a lot of uh, people to harvest and, and, and get it down to a point of uh, being effective. So it was a, an expensive replacement for prescription drugs. And now we have fentanyl because they've been able to replace heroin with fentanyl because it's very cheap, synthetic. They can get the precursors sent to them from China and they're starting to make this now. That, um, wave, the third wave is what we're in now, started in, in about 2013, and it has not stopped. 75% uh, of all the overdose deaths in 2020 are related to an opioid, and most of those, 77%, are related to fentanyl. In, um, when we look at the total numbers of overdose deaths here in Colorado, um, in 2020 we had 1477 and that grew to another 18, over 1,800. In the last four years, fentanyl deaths have become 10 times more prevalent 
Um, at least 912 people have died of illicit fentanyl in 2021 here in Colorado. Um, that's up from just 220 in 2019. So in just two years, we're seeing a stark increase in this fentanyl overdose-related re deaths, and it's continuing to rise. There is no end in sight at this point. When we look at overdoses due to all other types of drugs, they have remained somewhat flat over the years. Fentanyl is the red line here, and that rep represents the overdose deaths that were fentanyl only, and this dark orange line represents um, fentanyl deaths in addition to other drugs that were also taken at the time of the death. So fentanyl by far is causing many, many loss of lives. And in fact, fentanyl is the number one killer now for ages 18 to 45 year olds. That's more than car accidents, suicides, COVID, and cancer. What's more concerning What's also concerning, I should say, is that we're starting to see this in all ages, so in all demographics, but we're also starting now to see younger and younger kids accidentally pointed, poisoned unknowingly by this drug because it is found in almost all substances that you can get on the street or even order online uh, through social media. Our 10 to 18-year-old death rates due to fentanyl in the past two years has increased by 500% in the state of Colorado. We're going to stop here, and I'm going to switch over to a video that I'd like you to see that will tell us a little bit more about fentanyl before we continue talking. What is inside this vial could kill you almost instantly. In fact, this much would kill you and I if we split it. It's odorless, tasteless, and it's currently being disguised as nearly any drug you can buy off the street. This is fentanyl. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that is 100 times stronger than morphine and about 50 times the strength of heroin. Fentanyl has sedative effects and will rapidly slow down a person's breathing. Just a milligram too much of fentanyl can result in hypoxia, a decrease of oxygen to the brain, and can quickly lead to death. Sounds more like a poison than a drug. If you were to ingest fentanyl and live, your body would begin having withdrawals within a few hours. Fentanyl is one of the most addictive substances known to man. It is also rather cheap to produce considering its potency, which is why it is being used in all types of illicit drugs. Pills, cocaine, methamphetamine, MDMA, even some instances of marijuana, illegal drugs have been forever changed because of fentanyl. The most notable are the fake prescription pills. In 2021, the DEA alone seized over 20 million fake prescription pills made of fentanyl. These pills, designed to look exactly like prescription drugs such as oxycodone, Percocet, Xanax, Adderall, and more, contain nothing but fentanyl in a colored binder and are pressed to look just like the pills you would get from a pharmacy. The difference, though, is a matter of life or death. The DEA has reported over 42% of pills tested for fentanyl contain a potentially lethal dose. So maybe it's not the first pill someone takes, but one shortly after. Over the past few years, there has been enough fentanyl seized to kill every person in the United States. Fentanyl is being found everywhere in almost every drug, but you won't know it's there until it's too late. Your decision to not try a drug is one of the most important decisions that you can make. Over time, pop culture seems to glorify drugs more and more. Drugs have been promoted as solutions to mental health struggles like depression and anxiety. Trying drugs has been normalized as something that is just part of going through life. In reality, it is something that will take your life from you. With fentanyl's increasing prevalence in nearly all drugs today, promoting drug use is one of the most dangerous messages an influential person can communicate, especially to young people. The glamorous lifestyle associated with drug use is a facade. Many famous people suffer brutal addictions behind the scenes and fentanyl is exposing that truth. More and more great artists, athletes, and talents are falling to fentanyl. With them are many others who fell for the lie that using illicit drugs can solve any pain or problem in your life. It is a lie you must be smart enough to see through. Fentanyl is a death trap that very few escape once they enter into it. Do not be deceived. 
Fentanyl has turned drug dealers into death dealers, and today's easy access to drugs means that a dealer could be anybody. Most illicit drug sales today happen online and over social media. Many of the drug death stories I've encountered are of teens and young adults who bought a pill or a bit of cocaine and had it delivered to their family's house. A lot of times it was from somebody that they knew. Let's make this clear. It does not matter how well you think you know someone. It does not matter if they tell you the drug that they have is really what they say it is. You both do not know if fentanyl is in that drug until it is too late. Just because you've seen a friend try a drug, or even if you've tried something before, does not mean it's going to be safe. These drugs are not coming from a pharmacy or a lab with quality control. These drugs are being blended together by random people who do not care about you and bagged up for a quick profit. What seems like a safe dose could contain enough fentanyl to kill multiple people simply because of how carelessly these drugs are made. Again, you won't know until it's too late. Fentanyl is now the leading cause of death for young people in the United States. Some are looking for relief, some for a good time, many are just curious and make a stupid mistake. Had they known fentanyl was in the drugs they took, they never would have done it. But they can't take that choice back now. You though, have a choice to make for your life. You may struggle sometimes and feel like you need help. You may get curious or tempted to try a drug. Remember that feelings are temporary, but some decisions can last forever. You always have the opportunity to choose something greater, something that will give you life and not death. I encourage you today to realize how precious your life is and that one choice is all it takes to throw it away. Please do not do it. Remember that you have a purpose. You have gifts and passions that are unique to you. You were made to have a future. You can live an amazing life without ever touching a drug. Just keep going after the things you know are right, things that are good for you. You'll be an example for your friends and you can encourage them too. If you're a young person and learned something from this video today, I want you to share it with your friends because this information is saving lives right now. You could be the friend that saves someone's life by keeping them from making a big mistake. Please share it. If you're a parent or guardian and you want to learn more about how you can educate and protect your children from fentanyl poisoning, then I need you to head over to naturalhigh.org slash fentanyl right now and sign up with your email to receive the free fentanyl toolkit. Natural High will keep you updated with information and resources you can share with your children. My name is Dominic Tierno. My natural highs are faith and filmmaking. Thank you for watching. Powerful uh, video um, and important for us to talk the truth about this dangerous drug. I forgot to put on the microphone, sorry. Um, I just want to recognize that that is a heavy topic to watch, but it's so critical that you have this information and that you can talk to your, the youth in your, in your lives. Um, I'm going to bring Carol up now to share Jake's story. Um, thank you so much, Carol, for joining us. I think the stories are the most impactful, so I really appreciate you being here tonight. Um, I, that was extremely, extremely powerful. Um, my name is Carol, and... Um, I think I'm here to back up that, that video. Um, that's her son, um, Jake. Sorry, just a second. 15 months ago to, um, Fentanyl poisoning. He passed away on August 17, 2021. He was 21 years old. Um, he was entering his senior year of college, uh, getting a degree in computer science. He was super excited for his um, future. And um, he had a lot of dreams. Um, I think 
that um, I'd just like to share a little bit about Jake, kind of to um, let you know, to back this up, that fentanyl is everywhere, and I am kind of demystify that it's, you know, a drug user. It's not a, it's somebody addicted to drugs. Jake was a very um, ordinary kid, very extraordinary in many ways, but very ordinary. He grew up in Vail, very similar to um, here. He loved the outdoors. He went on service trips around the world. He played three sports. He was a star athlete. He, um, he, went, he entered college with enough AP credits to be a sophomore. Um, he was an eternal optimist. Um, really, 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 really happy, happy kid. Um, we had a celebration of life for him, and um, we had little cards that are, you know, share your memory of Jake. Countless, countless were like, he could brighten the darkest days with his smile. He cared so much, he loved so much. Um, I think the beauty of Jake was the sunshine that he just brought everywhere he went. So, um, he was a very ordinary kid. He, 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 um, um, he was the kid next door. And so I guess that by telling you his story that um, you realize that this could be your child, this could be your loved one who just says, hey, let's try this pill. Um, he was extraordinary in many ways, but so typical in so many ways. Um, so I just think it's really important for you all to have the tough conversations um, about drugs with your teens and your preteens and have them again and again. And to let, you know, you just don't know what you're going to say that's going to stick with them. And maybe, um, perhaps, they will say no um, in education. Thank you all so much for being here to learn and to educate yourselves. Um, you can change your story. I think it certainly could have changed mine. Um, you just don't be that parent that says that my kid. Um, and just please take what you learned here tonight and send your child into the world prepared um, for the kids out there. Of your family and your loved ones, if you ever are thinking about taking a pill or doing coke or just experimenting with drugs, um, it's 15 months and every day I, I lose my breath knowing that I'm never going to speak to my son again. Never gonna hold him. I'll never see him again. You know, he would have graduated college by now, embarking on this whole new chapter, jobs, falling in love, getting married, having kids. And I will never I just want to take that journey with him and, and never will. And his brother and sister should scroll together. His friends. He had a whole group of amazing friends and how, how hard it's been for them. Um, they were so traumatized by this and we'll never get to hear him laugh again. So, I just, um, I think if Jake, I know, if Jake knew the devastation that by taking this one pill would have brought to so many lives, never ever would he have taken it. And if he were here, he would just beg you not to ever take that risk because it could be never waking up. Um, Jake, we do know that um, a friend brought Jake the pills, pill, pills actually, because it was for a group of friends that were going to get together and just relax and hang out and play video games. Um, 
Jake took the pill. He was alone. Um, imagine how what his friend is going through who gave him the pill because neither one of them had any idea that that one pill that Jake took, one pill, was laced with 16 times the lethal dose of fentanyl. Um, the cause of death on his death certificate is accidental overdose. He took one, one pill. One pill is not an overdose. He had no intention of overdosing. He was murdered. One pill kills. One pill kills. So, um, um, I think coupled with this video that you just saw and Jake's story, and you realize it was just a casual choice that ended his life. Um, and sometimes those choices aren't so clear and easy. So um, you're going to be learning about the fentanyl strips and um, I call Narcan, there's other names for it. Um, I truly believe that if we knew about this epidemic and the life-saving tools that were out there that um, Jake would be with us. Um, so I think it's really important to also have this, like Amy said, you know, in your medicine cabinet, arm your kids with it when they go to school, college, I mean, maybe school, I don't know. Um, go to a concert, go to a party. Um, I guess, teach your children um, how precious they are and of all the dangers, but just teach them how to survive um, and never do drugs alone. Always have the Narcan and the strips and um, just know that your life is precious and something so casual as a pill can take it away. Um, so thank you all for listening and for being so proactive and taking the time to learn um, about fentanyl. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. I have no doubt that you sharing your story will prevent more loss. Uh, I do hope that you all will take this information and share it with your family and your friends so that we can continue this effort to not have anybody go through such great loss um, in their lives. So thank you, Carol, for sharing. So what we saw in the video and what Carol described in sharing Jake's story is that what we're seeing a lot of is fake pills. And the video described how drug dealers and the cartel make these drugs. There's no control. They get the fentanyl precursors. They make the powder. They put it in big barrels and just throw stuff in there, including the fentanyl and fillers that make up the rest of the pill. And then they put that mixture through pill press, pill, a pill press that looks exactly like other medications that people are seeking. So you can see um, the picture in the upper left hand corner of, it, of the screen. Uh, the top is the real prescription, the bottom is the fake pill, and you cannot tell the difference between, between them. What we see a lot of here locally, um, and the sheriff will talk about that, are the Dirty 30 or the blue pills. These are fake Oxycontin. But what we're also seeing more and more now are things called, uh, that a lot of youth will call, and college students are starting to call study drugs. And these are uh, Adderall and Xanax. 
And these drugs can help people concentrate. You know, we have, uh, for folks who might have a child with ADHD or a person who does, oftentimes that helps, uh, can help with concentration. So what we're seeing and hearing uh, that's happening on college camp campuses and other places is that students are seeking this out because they might have anxiety about a test or an exam and they think that will help them perform better. So they ask a friend or someone they know who might be selling these pills um, and then of course it's not what they think it is and could be fatal. We have another um, parent who has shared her story at other presentations uh, whose daughter Madeline um, grew up in Steamboat, uh, also went to CU like Jake, started her senior year, was um, just like Jake, a very good student, very involved in schools and athletics, um, was very, really anxious about starting her senior year. She knew that some of her friends had used Xanax before to help, um, and so went to the neighbor who she knew some of her friends had used to purchase a pill. Um, she purchased one that was like in the middle, the white pill, um, and took it and never woke up. That pill only cost $5 for her to get and to purchase. Um, so it's very cheap and easy to, to get. The other thing that we're seeing, which is a pretty alarming trend right now, is what's down on the bottom left. It's called rainbow fentanyl on the street. This is called Skittles. And it's another way that the cartels are um, creating something that will entice younger and younger people to try. Um, try this lethal substance, which is also addictive. So if you get a pill that isn't a lethal substance, you're highly likely to become addicted to it and want more of it. Uh, the problem is you never know how much is in one pill. Uh, and that is a problem. And we have fentanyl strips, which Carol talked about, in addition to the naloxone. And Annie can talk about that when she speaks. Um, but what's critically important for all of you to know is that if your kids are on social media, they have access to purchase fake pills. And so it's super important that you're monitoring social media. Because it's so, such small doses and it's easy and cheap to make, you can mail it right, uh, right to anybody's door, as we saw in the video. Um, and it can be delivered um, straight to the house. So it's important that, to also understand that kids aren't typically intentionally looking for fentanyl. You know, and kids use drugs for lots of reasons, and it's important for us to not expect that, that kids will not experiment or try things. We need to be honest about that when we speak to them. Um, youth may use drugs for self-medication. A lot of times we'll see underlying mental illness um, present, and, and so youth are trying to self-medicate for that. Youth may experiment with friends in social settings. settings. They may use drugs uh, for the feeling or to per perform better in school, like I just mentioned. And fake pills are easy to get. Uh, they can be delivered, as I mentioned. They're not intentionally seeking this out. They don't know that it's in there. But they need to know that this risk exists. Uh, we're also now seeing youth um, vaping fentanyl more and more as well. Signs uh, of Possible uh, opioid involvement or misuse and abuse in, in teens has been studied. It doesn't mean that any of these things mean that your uh, child might be misusing or abusing drugs, but it are, it's important for you to think about or to pay attention. So you might see negative changes in grades, skipping classes or school, dropping longtime friends, loss of interest in usual activities, changes in appearance, changes in general behavior, including sleeping and eating habits. What you can do as a parent is learn how to, not learn how to, hopefully you've been talking with your students and your children, um, but understanding your influence as a parent is critically important. And this isn't a one and done talk. This is something that happens over years and time to check in with your uh, with the youth in your lives, uh, to learn as much as you can by being here tonight. We have other resources available for you. Choosing a good time and place. I'm a parent of two adolescents, and I know it's hard to find the right time to speak to them. Uh, when I want to talk to them, they're not always willing to hear. So really 
seizing those opportunities, using open-ended questions to see what they already know about fentanyl. Have you heard about fentanyl? What do you know about fentanyl? Um, using active listening, establishing that eye contact, uh, talking about short and long-term effects of a decision that they may, might make. Uh, talking about future plans is critically important to establish um, you know, long-term goals in their lifetime. Um, you can talk about what you're seeing in movies and on TV uh, and what they think about that. Have they seen anybody taking pills at school? What do you think about that? What would you do if somebody offered this to you? Uh, and you can play through these scenarios and that helps solidify uh, both your expectations of them and also helps them role play something that they might encounter. Um, and then uh, before we hand it over to share, the sheriff, there are lots of great resources online. One Pill Can Kill is the DEA, DEA uh, resources. They have toolkits for parents. The Dead on, a lot, on Arrival video that the students will be watching tomorrow. Um, there's a longer length video of that, the natural high we shared. Um, get smart about drugs. There are lots of tools out there that can help you. We are seeing kids overdosing in school across the nation. And last spring, there was a student who overdosed at a high school in Colorado Springs. So we're really working with the school to get naloxone on campus. And it's available in case something like that were to happen here in the school. But please, please, please heed Carol, Carol's story. And don't, just because your child might be involved in things, don't think that couldn't be my child. We need to be honest about what opportunities for this risk, risky behavior might happen in their lifetime. I'm going to turn it over to the sheriff uh, so he can talk more about what we're seeing in our community. Thanks. Uh, you can see the slide up here that has some of the Summit County statistics, but so I'll try to slow down. <laughs> uh, but what I will tell you, if anything, is you know, you're, you're getting a lot of information here tonight about this. And this is real, and this is in our community. And if there's anything I can do to be of value to this conversation is to validate everything you're seeing in these slides that you saw in that video. That video is incredible. Um, and, and it's spot on. And I would tell you that uh, whether it's Jake's story that Carol tells, or the other stories that we've heard from parents, uh, boy, there's nothing more impactful than that. I mean, we're all parents in here, right? Some of us, some of us grandparents. But um, I would tell you that um, you know we have a responsibility to these to these young kids that are you know probably a lot of this is going right over their head. But I'll tell you what, they're they're right in the age group. They should know this information. This, this drug is everywhere out there. Um, Although I, you know, work really hard with Amy and have for years in this community on, on harm reduction and the, the household medication take back that we've been doing in this community for years when the opioid epidemic started um, and we continue, uh, this is a whole new thing. And this is a whole new version of harm reduction that we're talking about with naloxone and fentanyl test strips and stuff that may sound real um, foreign to you. But I would tell you that Everybody should carry fentanyl. You should all have it in your homes. You should all have it in naloxone. What did I say? Fentanyl? Okay, nobody carry fentanyl. Uh, okay, see, I've been talking about it too much. See, everybody should carry naloxone, uh, you know, in their car, in their house, at their office. At, you know, we give it away at the sheriff's office. We have for years. Uh, we started carrying it in 2019, the law passed, the legislation passed that allow law enforcement and public safety to go out naloxone, naloxone, not fentanyl. And we've, we've been carrying it since then. And we've seen some miraculous recoveries, or I should say reversals here in the community. Uh, and we continue to see them. We had a couple overdoses in the last week here uh, that were fatal. Um, and we've had, like I said, we've had a lot of uh, remarkable reversals, but what we don't know, what we can't capture, because we give away so much naloxone, is how many reversals are happening out there that we don't know about, um, or that are just uh, a, a medical response, a fire response, and law enforcement's not called. But it's happening out there, um, and th this is being uh, passed around in the community. I, I don't know that it's really stopping anybody from doing it, um, the fentanyl, because you, know, you always have that, that trigger in your head saying, well, it's not gonna happen to me. 
but I can tell you that it is, it's happening to everybody, all age groups. Um, we're seeing a, a ton of it come into the community. I work tirelessly with our state and federal partners, tracking the dope that's, that's coming into the country, that's coming across the United States, the travel routes. Uh, just last month, we just started the sheriff's office. We just started a new narcotics interdiction team that has a canine that's going to start enforcing this stuff and trying to get some of this dope before it uh, crosses through our community. But it, it's a real threat out there. And, and these statistics, the slides, it's, it's all real. So if you needed the validation, here it is. Uh, because sometimes we need that. But I'm telling you that if you think that this is, this is a too young a group to be talking to us about with your kids at this age, it's not. This is the right age uh, to introduce this conversation and be talking about it and be open about it and have Narcan or Naloxone available. All right, thank you, Amy. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Sheriff. So Annie's going to talk about this antidote that everyone needs to know about and how to use it. All right. So echoing what Amy and the Sheriff have said, uh, this is really scary information that we're presenting tonight. But there are strategies out there for preventing these unnecessary overdoses. We know that 40% of overdoses, there is someone else present. Uh, so that is 40% of overdoses that do not have to result in death, um, especially if we equip ourselves with the prevention tools like the fentanyl test strips and the naloxone. Very briefly about fentanyl test strips, we are working on a policy with Summit County Public Health to try and get them uh, here in the county for free for distribution. Um, that's not ha where we're at quite yet, but they are cheap and easy to find if you Google them. There are several websites you can get them on Amazon. If you or someone you know it loves to attend festivals or parties or you have high schoolers, middle schoolers, um, even college age students, it's never a bad idea to have those on hand, have them in your wallet. Um, highly recommend those. And then, of course, our saving grace is our opioid antagonist medication, which is used to reverse opioid overdoses. Uh, so opioid receptors are found all throughout your body and your brain, your brain stem, your periphery, even your GI tract. That's why opioids have such a profound effect on our entire bodies. Um, but with continued opioid use over time, our receptors throughout the body become less and less responsive. So our body starts to build tolerance to the opioid, um, meaning that we would likely need more and more and more of it to feel those same effects. Uh, that means people are increasing their doses quite rapidly, which makes overdose very likely. So our window for bystander response. Uh, with fentanyl, it's a lot shorter than it is with other opioids. Uh, you can see in orange, uh, the bystander window for heroin is significantly longer, about five to 30 minutes before someone might slip into respiratory depression. With fentanyl, we're looking anywhere between zero to two minutes after they ingested that substance. So uh, the effects of overdose are happening really, really quickly. Um, so someone's going to start by having respiratory depression. The opioids in their system have relaxed their breathing mechanisms so much that their body kind of forgets to breathe in general. Uh, that sometimes leads to apnea, so no breathing at all, uh, which in turn, they become unresponsive, and then their heart eventually stops. Um, all of that can happen in as little as 5 to 20 minutes after somebody ingests fentanyl. So an opioid overdose happens, uh, like I kind of mentioned before, when you have too many opioids bound to too many receptors throughout the body, your whole entire system is kind of flooded or overwhelmed. Uh, breathing slows down, it slows down, and it eventually stops. Um, even if your breathing doesn't stop and someone isn't, doesn't die from an opioid overdose, um, there is always the threat of injury to the brain from lack of oxygen. Um, so the quicker we can identify an overdose and respond, the better outcomes we are likely to have. So uh, with naloxone, naloxone actually has a stronger affinity. It's more attracted to those opioid receptors than even the opioid molecules themselves. Um, so it's able to come in and bump the opioid molecules off of their receptors. Uh, so now you just have these free-floating opioid molecules. And while those molecules are floating around, the naloxone is going to bind to that receptor and act as a protective mechanism. So once the naloxone is bound to the opioid receptors, none of those free-floating opioids are able to rebind. Uh, naloxone works for about 30 to 90 minutes. So uh, 
For that 30 to 90 minute period, the opioid molecules are not able to rebind. There is always a chance that someone could slip back into overdose after that 30 to 90 minute window, which we will talk more about. Um, and an interesting fact, a review of emergency medical services data from a women's hospital in Massachusetts found that when given naloxone, 93.5% of people survived their overdose and were still alive a year later. So we know that knowledge is power. We know that giving people a second opportunity allows them to make better choices in the future. Uh, so we're not enabling people or encouraging them to use drugs. We're really looking at giving them a second chance to make a better decision. So how do we recognize the symptoms of an opioid overdose? Uh, if we think about opioids get into our body and they basically slow everything down. They depress everything. So your pupils might get really, really small. Your breathing is going to slow way down. It might even stop. If you hear a noise in the back of the throat, kind of a, cho a choking or gurgling sound that sounds like it's coming from way deep down, that's what we call the death rattle. Very morbid term. Uh, however, it's a great indicator that someone needs your help right now. Uh, their blood flow is also going to slow down, so their skin will get kind of cold and clammy. Their lips and their fingernails and the tips of their fingers might start to turn blue. That's another great indicator that someone's not getting the oxygen that they need. Uh, most, of pe most people experiencing opioid overdose are going to be not responsive, so they probably wouldn't be able to talk to you. Um, their body might be really limp and heavy and hard to move, and their heart rate's going to slow way down along with their blood pressure. So if you suspect an overdose, your first step is always going to be uh, recognizing those signs and symptoms that we just talked about and then trying to stimulate that person. We really want to assess what their level of consciousness is. Uh, so I always start by calling the person's name. Hello, hey, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, if the person does not respond to you verbally, our next step is going to be to try and stimulate them more physically. You can all take your hand, make a fist, find the pointy part of your knuckles. You put that over your breastbone and rub up and down pretty hard. If you all try it right now, you'll know it does not feel good. If someone is conscious at all, uh, the harder you press, the more likely they are to respond. Uh, so that's our second step. We're going to make sure that they're really out. And we've identified that we think they might be experiencing an opioid overdose. Uh, I also like to let someone know, I have Narcan and I'm going to use it. They might be unconscious, they might not hear you, but someone else might. Uh, you're always going to call 911 when you're ready to administer naloxone as well. Uh, your first responders are trained to deal with the symptoms of withdrawal. They are trained to deal with opioid overdoses. So even if you're totally confident that you can re reverse this opioid overdose, we still have to call 911 uh, and follow through with them, especially because that person might slip back into overdose after that 30 to 90 minute window. Uh, it is also extremely important that if you do call 911 and administer naloxone, you have to stay with that person, please. Uh, even if they start to experience uh, normal breathing patterns, they might slip into withdrawal. It can be scary for that person and for the responder. Uh, so you do want to be there to provide support and explain what happened while you wait for EMS to arrive. All right, so each naloxone box of, this is Narcan, this is a brand name. It's all called naloxone. That's the generic name for the drug. There are several preparations available. The ones we see most commonly here in Summit County are Narcan in this pink box, and there's another orange box called Boxado. Uh, both of them are the exact same drug. They contain naloxone. They're both safe and effective for reversing opioid overdose. Uh, Narcan always has instructions right underneath the front label. On Boxado, it's a little bit smaller thinner box and the directions are on the back. So even if you forget everything that you learned tonight, uh, you always have the support of the directions right here on the box. Uh, every single box of naloxone comes with two separate doses. Each dose is in a separate applicator that's totally closed. So you're gonna have two in each box. As soon as you open it, it looks like this. So when we're ready to administer, we want the person laying flat on their back. We're going to provide support to the back of their necks. So you can just slip your hand behind their head uh, and kind of tilt their head back to get a great angle where you can get up their nose. Uh, you want to put both of your fingers on either side of the applicator with your thumb on the plunger. Have a demo. You're going to insert this applicator until your fingers are flush with the person's nostril. It's pretty far up there. 
but get it up there. And then you're going to administer one good spray, and that is one dose of naloxone administered. We want to wait a full two to three minutes. It's going to feel like hours if you're ever in this situation, but try to wait. Uh, if you have 911 on the phone, that's a great timer. Uh, you can always check your time there. If we wait two minutes and the person is still not responding and they're not breathing normally, we're going to take out our other package of naloxone, do the exact same thing, administer it in the other nostril. If you can't remember which nostril, don't worry about it, just get it in there. Uh, but we try to go for opposite nostrils to increase absorption. So each box, two doses, you're gonna wait two to three minutes between doses. Uh, you do not have to prime this nasal spray at all. You don't have to give it any sort of love or juice before you spray it in the nose, one good spray, get all of that drug into the person's nose. You absolutely cannot hurt someone by administering naloxone. It is safe to use in children of any age. It is safe to use in pregnant women. Um, it will have no effect on someone that doesn't have opioids in their system. So if one of us were to administer it right now, nothing would happen. Uh, so that is why if you're ever unsure that someone's experiencing an opioid overdose, but you have naloxone, absolutely use it. You will not cause harm to someone. By using it, you will only potentially save a life. Uh, also, make sure, hopefully, that that person doesn't wake up from their overdose and ingest more opioids because like I said, they could easily slip back into overdose. Uh, right. So if the person does start breathing normally after one dose, two doses, three doses, etc., cetera, uh, we would like to roll them into the recovery position. That's on their side. Uh, if the person does start to experience symptoms of withdrawal, those can be quite intense. Some people do vomit. Uh, and by placing them on their side, we're kind of keeping their airway clear so that they're not choking uh, on anything that they might vomit. Uh, it can be very scary if someone's going through withdrawal, but remember that they need support just as much as you do, and EMS will support you once they arrive. Your job is to support that person. All right, so we also have this incredible app called OP Rescue. Uh, this is our Summit County-specific QR code. So we are extremely grateful that we've been selected as a pilot site to collect data on how much naloxone we are distributing, how many people are downloading the app, um, how many opioid overdose reversals are happening here in the county, but this app can really help you look for signs of overdose, where can you get naloxone, uh, it can tell you step-by-step -step directions, all you do is press start and it'll walk you through the whole process of administering naloxone. You can also report that you did administer a dose. It's completely anonymous, uh, it's just for data collection purposes, and then it can always provide you locations of where you can get treatment or where you can restock on your naloxone, which will always be at Summit County Public Health in Frisco or the sheriff's office. No questions asked, please come see us. Uh, you can have as much naloxone as you need. Um, we will always have that for you. So please, uh, at this QR code is also on the side of every single box of naloxone that we have that we're gonna hand out tonight. So please encourage your loved ones to download it, uh, especially if you're giving them a box of naloxone. It's a perfect education tool to go along with it. All right, as far as legislation, you are protected by several different laws here in Colorado. They've done a, uh, a ton of political movements to kind of protect the people that uh, aren't you know, medical providers but might be needing to administer naloxone. So the Good Samaritan law states that you are immune from prosecution as well if you report uh, a drug or alcohol-related overdose to a medical professional law enforcement EMS firefighter, as long as you stay with that person and cooperate with EMS, you will not get in trouble. Even if you also have drugs in your system or have drugs on you or you sold them the drugs, it doesn't matter. Uh, you are protected by law and so is that person. So that person will not get in trouble for having used drugs. They will most likely be equipped with prevention tools for next time, some naloxone and some education. Uh, and then there's also the third party naloxone law, which allows for other people outside of medical professionals to administer naloxone specifically. Um, so yes, always stay with the person, always report it to 911, um, identify yourself, be cooperative, be kind. The law enforcement and the EMS uh, and the firefighters are there to help you. Okay. I'm gonna hand it back over to Amy. Thanks, Amy. Um, so make sure you get some naloxone for as much as you want uh, uh, after we are done tonight. I'm going to have Elizabeth come on up. She's going to 
talk about some additional upcoming trainings that parents can attend uh, and other, program we, uh, other programming we do in our Youth and Family Services Department. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Edgar and I'm with the Summit County Government Youth and Family Department. So just as a follow-up to that presentation, we wanted to let you know about some of the programming we have at Youth and Family. Um, we have quite a few parent education and trainings. We're re working with the middle school to do an Askable Adult Training on February the 2nd. So if you're sitting there thinking like, I do not know how to have this conversation with my child, um, the training will provide some tips on having um, difficult conversations with teens. So when we get closer to the date, we will send out some reminders and information about that training. We also have in our department other trainings that we offer. We have a positive youth development training and also a mental health first aid for youth training. So as those come available, we will get those to the school to get out to you. The other thing we wanted to mention, we have a Communities That Cares Coalition. The idea around the CTC group is to build a community um, of stakeholders that care about youth health. So if you're interested in participating, we have flyers in the back. Part of that group, we have a youth coalition. So Amy mentioned earlier the YES group. That stands for Youth Empowerment Society of Summit. So we have high school students that attend two um, meetings a month, and they're active in the community um, and advocate for health, leadership pieces that are important to youth. And we are also working with the Summit Middle School to start a, U, a YES group at the middle school that will meet once a month after school. So again, look for information on that schedule that's going to come out. Also, we wanted to mention, um, through Youth and Family, we have a lot of information going, on, going out about vaping. So you may have heard about the Vaping Sucks campaign. If you have a youth with you, and they would love to take home a vaping sucked, sucks mug, we would love to send that. If your youth is not here, you can take them with you. But we also wanted to mention there's a website that has a lot of information and resources and tools for parents. Again, talking to your youth about vaping, other substances, how to have those conversations, and just some information about vaping in general. And lastly, if you've not heard about it, we have a teen center called The Drop. Um, it is open Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays after school, and it's open to middle school and high school age youth. It's open till 5.30, so they're always welcome to drop in, and we have some other resource information on that on the back table. So I think that's it. Thank you again for showing up. Oh, and now, um, here's Kellen from Building Hope to talk about some additional resources. Hi, everybody. I'm Kellen Ender. I'm the program manager at Building Hope. Um, and Building Hope is a nonprofit here in Summit County that is really designed to bring more resources and collaboration between all of the um, entities in Summit County that are providing mental health resources. Uh, one of the things that is more recent to Summit County is the Summit Wellness Hub, um, and that is a place where there are um, outpatient mental health resources and substance abuse and misuse counseling services and groups. And then also there is a, a Front Range Clinic, which is a medication-assisted treatment center uh, for folks who are looking to um, come off of opiate addictions. So if there's any need for that, you can find those resources at the summitwellnesshub.org. Um, and that's a new entity in Summit County located in the medical office building. Um, we also have a number of different resources uh, at Building Hope. We have our scholarship program, uh, which offers up to 12 free sessions of care for anyone who lives or works in Summit County. 
All young people who are uh, living or going to school in Summit County are also eligible for those sessions. We just ask that you call Building Hope. You can also get these scholarships through the FERC uh, and through the school district as well, talking to the school counselor or the school social worker. Um, there's also Mind Springs Health, which has youth, pro youth, program youth programming. Um, Colorado Mountain Medical is a new resource in the community as well. They have uh, opportunities and therapy available for young people and families. Mile High Behavioral Health is within the Summit Wellness Hub, and that is the outpatient behavioral health clinic. And they are starting more resources for young people, such as groups for the LGBTQ plus community, as well as substance misuse. The Height is our youth program, um, and that is connectedness events for young people designed specifically for kids aged 12 to 18 years old. Uh, they do lots of fun activities. They go rock climbing, they go paddle boarding, they go hiking, they go cross country skiing. And that's just really an avenue to get people together, get kids together doing fun activities, meeting new people, uh, and doing things that are positive for their mental health. They're also always gonna hear about resources that are in the community for uh, their, their mental health. Uh, the Family and Intercultural Resource Center also has lots of great resources for parenting, classes, tips and tricks, and uh, lots of different avenues for support for families. Um, Summit Advocates is also a nonprofit that is really organized around helping support people with legal advocacy and supporting uh, domestic violence and sexual abuse. And then the drop as well. Uh, Elizabeth just mentioned that, but we do a lot of partnership with Youth and Family Services and the drop at the Teen Center. Uh, we do a movie night for uh, Yes Kids and uh, the Hype Kids. Anyone who wants to join can come see a free movie at the, the Dillon Movie Theater. Um, and that's a really fun event once a month. Um, other things that we do, we do have family connectedness events at Building Hope. So every week there's a new opportunity. Uh, the hype is once a week as well uh, for just young people. And then family connectedness events, we have bilingual events, Spanish speaking and English speaking events that are on our calendar all the time. And you can re find those on our calendar of events on buildinghopesummit.org. Um, and then we also have mental health navigation, which is through Family and Intercultural Resource Center. If you have no idea where to go and how to access support and you don't know what you need, the navigators at FERC are a great resource to look into. Um, and then we also have a peer support program uh, that we're looking to expand to young people as well. And that's about it. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kellen. Um, so that is the end of our formal presentation, I do want to ask um, you all to fill out our survey. The QR code is uh, at all of your tables. We have been able to fine tune this presentation depending on the population we're speaking to and the feedback is critically important for us to get and hear from you all um, about your thoughts uh, about tonight. I hope you will share this information with friends and family. Um, anybody really, grandparents too, uh, need this information. Anybody who has a youth or a young adult uh, in their lives, it's important that we, we, as a community, make sure everyone here understands the risk that is true uh, and is there in our community.